Hi, I'm Stina McDougall. Welcome back to another episode of Get Outside. It's fall, and we've taken advantage of some spectacular weather to take you on some outdoor adventures right here in Essex County. Coming up first, Jim McDougall takes us on a quick tour of the Halibut Point State Park Reservation in Rockport. Then Tom Young brings us some video of the fall migrating birds. After that, Bob Spear is back with his daughter Sarah Spear on an adventure at Mass Audubon's Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield. They'll go exploring for turtles. Be sure to stay tuned when we bring you a quick tip on how to use light to your advantage for both bird watching and photography. I'll be back at the end of the show for a quick resource review. So stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Get Outside, a locally produced television show that features the abundance of natural resources and wildlife that exist right here in Essex County, a small county just north of Boston and with an easy ride from southern New Hampshire, southern Maine, and the central and western parts of the state. Our goal is really to introduce you to some of the wonderful places that we have in Essex County. Properties owned by the Essex County Greenbelt Association, Massachusetts Audubon Society, the Trustees of Reservations, as well as the Division of Forest and Parks and Mass Wildlife. We really want you to take advantage of these properties, get outside, see some wildlife, and really know what you're looking at. So we've offered some tips and some resources that we think are extremely valuable and are worth acquiring. All of the great wildlife that you're seeing and the show is shot locally right here in Essex County. Our show is only 30 minutes long, but if you want more information on natural history in the area and places to go, you can always visit our website, which is getoutsidetv.org. So what we need to do is get outside. Hello and welcome to our quick tour of the Halibut Point State Park in Rockport, Massachusetts. This is a uniquely beautiful coastal landscape just on the northern tip of Cape Ann, sandwiched between Folly Cove and Andrews Point. It's just off of Route 127. This state park is set up to help you enjoy this landscape and to learn about Cape Ann's granite industry and is managed by Mass Parks and the Trustees of Reservations, a Massachusetts conservation organization. Looking seaward on a clear day, the view stretches from Crane Beach in Ipswich to Mount Agamenicus in Maine and to the Isles of Shoals off the coast of New Hampshire. The visitor center is located in a renovated World War II fire control tower near the edge of the Babson Farm Quarry. The center features exhibits related to the park's natural and cultural history. Beginning in the 1840s, granite was quarried from this area, first on a small scale, and then on a much larger scale when the Rockport Granite Company acquired the Babson Farm Quarry and expanded its operation. Cape Ann granite weighs about 168 pounds per cubic foot. Moving stone from the floor of the quarry to the surface posed a major challenge to the 19th century technology. At its deepest point, the Babson Farm Quarry is about 60 feet deep. Borrowing techniques that were used on large sailing ships, quarrymen devised an arrangement of blocks and tackles and pulleys called a derrick to hoist the heavy stones. 
Once the block reached the surface, it was moved by oxen, horses, and train to nearby sheds where the man shaped it into paving blocks, curbing, building stones, or ornamental pieces. Here in Halibut Point, granite was transported directly to the wharf at Folly Cove, where the stone was loaded onto specially designed sloops that carried it to markets all over the hemisphere. Many of the vessels that sailed from Folly Cove carried Cape Ann granite along the coast for use in constructing bridges, tunnels, buildings, warehouses, and monuments, as well as to pave thousands of city streets as far away as Havana, Cuba, and Valparaiso, Chile. A nice feature about this granite landscape is that there are no trees. The ocean scours this particular coastline during big northeastern storms, as you can see right here, where the wind comes howling in along with uh, waves up to uh, 10 feet, leaving essentially no trees, no shrubs, just a few sedges in the cracks of some of the granite rock. And below the tide line, one sees all the different algaes that exist on our coastline. This happens to be uh, Condus crispus, which is Irish moss and harbors a whole bunch of insects, uh, invertebrates, for crows and seagulls to feed on. If you're lucky enough to have a, a small craft like a kayak, when there's a south wind and the seas are flat, this is a nice place to take a little paddle around and get to see the grout pile and the coastline from the seaside of things. The reason we were out here was to do some bird watching. Here's four white-winged scoters that are flying by. The scoter is a type of a duck and it does show up here on our shores in October and, and remains through the winter time. Here's another mixed flock of scoters. This would have white-winged scoters, possibly some surf scoters, and some black scoters. Along with some of the ducks flying by, we also had uh, gannets coming in quite close. Again, they were feeding on what we assume was probably mackerel at this time of year. These are two adult gannets. They're white with black wing tips, and they are as large as a loon. They like to feed by plunge diving, which is the, they will go up to um, 50 to 100 feet off the water and simply dive, dive in after the fish. It's remarkable to see that when they're up close. This is an immature gannet, which looks quite different than the adults. Watch here closely as a couple of them do some plunge dives. These are purple sandpipers that you will find along the shoreline. These are our winter sandpipers. The real pleasure of the day turned out to be this flock of harlequin ducks that came right in and uh, we walked down to the beach to get you some uh, better close-ups. Enjoy!
Coming up next, Tom Young brings us a segment on some of the birds you should expect to see in the fall, right here in Essex County. It seems to be common knowledge that in the fall, birds fly south for the winter, at least in the northern hemisphere. But bird migration is a more wonderfully complex phenomenon than that. In fact, migration strategies are almost as diverse as birds themselves. One thing that all migrating birds do have in common, however, is the need for large amounts of food to fuel their journeys. So if you get outside this fall and visit an area that is rich in natural bird food, you're sure to find a good variety of birds tanking up. For example, a weedy field, though perhaps not attractive to our eyes, provides a buffet for avian migrants, especially sparrows. A marsh is also an excellent place to find migrating birds, such as this fishing bittern. As this rail discovers, sometimes it's a good idea to have a bath before you fly south. Even a parking lot can be a good place for a migrating bird to find food, if it just knows where to look. If you spend time watching the sea, you'll encounter some spectacularly plumaged sea ducks. Many of these will stay in our area for the entire winter, feeding off the rocky coast of Cape Ann and other such places. also be lucky enough to find a loon in its winter dress. And don't forget to check out woods where pine cones can provide a good source of food. Winter finches like this red crossbill are irregular migrants. Some years we have lots of them in our area, and some years we have none. The same is true for pine siskins. Always remember to have your feeders up in the fall as that's when birds need the food most. There are birds that may seem to disappear from our area, but like this goldfinch, perhaps they've just changed to a duller plumage for the winter. Sometimes birds even go in the wrong direction. That's why a Midwestern breeding bird like the Dick Sissel might turn up in New England in the fall. If you're looking for migrating birds, who knows what you might find? So pick up your binoculars and get outside. Now let's join Sarah Spear in search of Godzilla. Hi, my name is Sarah. Don't you just love to get outside on beautiful days like this during the fall and just explore for a while? Look at these woolly bears that I found. It's hard to believe that these guys will stay as caterpillars the whole winter. Hey, another animal that I like to look for during the fall is turtles. Let's go see if we can find some. to look for turtles is ponds. As a matter of fact, let's look in this pond. Just by sitting quietly for a few minutes, you'll notice that there's a number of turtles around here. This 
is an eastern painted turtle, probably our most common turtle. Painted turtles like to live in water, but they also bask in the sun on logs. Snapping turtles are our largest turtles. Wow, he's a big guy. The reason that they snap is that they can't go inside their shell. So they have to snap for defense. Look at those claws. We named this guy Godzilla because he's so big. Sometimes you can only see their nose. Eastern box turtle. We don't usually have these in Essex County. He's beautiful. The neat thing about these guys is, you think that most turtles go in water, but he doesn't. Look at the orange eye on him. Looking at the camera. <laughs> See the hinge on him? That helps him to close up when he needs to. See how this moves? Doesn't want to close up right now, but he's really beautiful. Well, we better let him on his way now and go see if we can find some other turtles. Bye, little guy.
turtles is in a canoe. Today on the Ipswich River, we're going to see what we can find. Here's another painted turtle. If it's nice and sunny, we should see lots of these. Here's another little guy. Hey, here's a musk turtle or stink pot turtle. They call that because they give off a bad smell. Here's another painted turtle. Looks like he just climbed out of the water. You can get outside on beautiful fall days like this and explore for turtles too. Now let's join Jim McDougall for some quick tips on using lighting when you're bird watching. Hi, we're here at uh, Sandy Point State Park at the southern end of Plum Island to show you a little, um, give you a little demonstration on the use of light when you're bird watching. Uh, right here we are looking at some sandpipers which are difficult by themselves to identify, but we've even created a more difficult situation by looking into the sunshine. This is called backlighting. It's a, a very artistic approach to um, photography but it also presents some dramatic problems for uh, the bird watcher. Now, we assume these are sandpipers. They have long legs and most of them have long skinny bills. They are working along the shoreline, more or less like sanderlings, but because they uh, are giving us absolutely no color, we're just getting a silhouette, it's nearly impossible for us to identify these birds. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of flip the camera around so that um, we will get the sunshine behind us, as you should do when you're bird watching. Uh, whenever possible, make sure the sun is behind you. And what happens is you begin to see birds like this. We are now seeing all the feathers on the birds. We're noticing that uh, even though these two sandpipers look very similar, they are in fact two different species. Now, we wouldn't have known that if we had the sun behind them and we were just looking at their silhouettes. So uh, the bird that you're now looking at is a white rumped sandpiper. The bird that had walked off to the left is a semi-palmated sandpiper. Uh, to get a uh, better look at some of these birds, you can see now that we're looking at three species of shorebirds. Uh, the one on the right is a ruddy turnstone. The one just to its left is a semi-palmated sandpiper that just walked off the screen. And the two that are remaining are white rump sandpipers. So this gives you a little uh, idea of how important it is to use light to your favor when you're out bird watching. Welcome to the resource review section of Get Outside. We really hope you enjoyed the show. 
We have a few books from our bookshelf that you might enjoy reading to augment the segments that you just saw, specifically on turtles. Here's the Stokes Nature Guide, a guide to amphibians and reptiles by Tom Tining. And another local author, David Carroll from New Hampshire. These are great reads, The Year of the Turtle and a Swamp Walker's Journal. For the birding segment of our show, if you don't have these, we do highly recommend them. The Peterson Field Guide to the Birds of Eastern and Central North America, which is great to take with you in the field. Another book that I really enjoy is the Sibley Guide. It's a little bit larger, but it's easy to take it with you in your car or a great coffee table book to review when you get back from being outside. I hope you enjoyed the show. We thought we'd give you a little treat at the uh, end of the show. We've got a minute left here, and um, it's nice to see wildlife. This is a small female coyote that walked into the yard. Uh, we were watching it from our porch, and the reason why it uh, seems interested at um, what's off to your left is um, uh, two other coyotes just came through, two large males that um, have attracted her attention. Now the nice thing about looking at this video is you get a chance to study a coyote which usually they're somewhat fleeting out in the woods uh, or uh, galloping across a hay field or something like that. Now the one thing that I use to identify a coyote as, uh, um, in comparison to a, a dog is uh, coyotes don't have collars. I usually look at that first. Um, there's that little bit of uh, black pattern on the back as well. Uh, it's got a very pointed snout, uh, it's alert, and normally a coyote should be uh, afraid of you and uh, move away when it sees you. If it doesn't, I'd be a little concerned and let yourself be known. So get out there and enjoy seeing coyotes. <laughs>